to walk upon sacred mother earth like this. And thank the creator for that breath of air that this young man was talking about. <coughs> I also want to thank the creator for the ability to be able to move around without the aid of a wheelchair or a cane. I want to thank the creator for this wonderful day that he has given us. I want to thank the creator for making this a possibility. All these beautiful people that have come here to share what they have acquired and experienced in their lives. I want to also thank the keepers of this land, all the spirits, the ones that have gone on from this territory and asked their permission and their indulgence so that it will allow me to be able to share from where I come from as I am a visitor here. I have tobacco and prints here, which is my culture, to offer to them. I did not have the opportunity to be able to talk to someone from this territory to offer them those prints and thank them for allowing me to be here today. Oh! I want to thank our Mother, the Earth, for allowing us to live upon her sacred body and for providing us with all the nourishment that we need each and every day. And we're talking about her today, and I want to ask her permission so that I can verbalize what we think we need to do, but I ask for her guidance ah! to give us those words because she tells us what she would like us to do. She knows, as all do the spirits, the direction that we need to go. Ah! This altar that I have put here it's things that I use in my ceremonies. I have the sacred tree here, and the handle of this rattle, and I have the grandfather rocks inside here, and I have the four leggings that cover this. I want to thank them for being here. We have not lost anything. Anything that the Creator had made cannot be lost. We can stray away from it, but it will always be there. It always has been there. It is there for us to return to. I am deeply honored to be in the presence of these people who work so very, very hard to the educational system to get to where they are today. The many things that they have written about that come from their heart, things they believe in so deeply and are sharing with us today, for me it is a great honor. My name in English is White Standing Buffalo. The birth name that I was given was Thomas McCallum. In my language, I am called a Chakaskatam. Chakaskatam is honored to be here. Chachaksugan is another name that I carry. Chachaksugan is honored to be here today. To share with you some of what I do, of what they call sustainable wisdom. Before I go into that, I would like to share a story, a little story, a short one, about how I came to get here. How did I end up here? I grew up in a northern community, Sagitawak, that's what we call it in my language. The French call it Ile de Cross, 
means island of La Crosse. And I went to a Catholic school. I went to a, what the Métis people call a boarding school. They didn't call it a residential school, they called it a boarding school, but it's the same thing. The only thing lacking was we didn't get funding from the government to pay for our stay there. So we had these comics about Notre Dame. And I didn't know anything other than Isle of the Cross, Bush, little Bush community. I didn't know about cities, I didn't know anything about the United States, and, but I knew about this Notre Dame. <laughs> and there was a comic that they gave us, and there was this character, his name was Chuck White. He was the main character who came to Notre Dame. <coughs> and he played football. When I was on the street in Vancouver, my nickname is Charlie, so everybody calls me Chuck. And then when I got my native name, White Standing Buffalo, so shortened that to Chuck White, right? <laughs> <laughs> Comic came alive. <laughs> I had a dream. February the 13th, 2007. I dreamt of a rattle like this that was made out of a rock. And it had a five pointed star on it. But also on the side of it, it had a quiver with four arrows. And I told my wife about it, and we were trying to figure out what it meant. We had different interpretations. Didn't really know. I didn't know about four arrows. I didn't meet him till last year. He came to a Sundance that I conduct in northern British Columbia. He came and danced there. But I had heard about him through another colleague of his who goes to Fielding University. She took her doctorate there. She told me about four arrows. So I Googled him and I heard him talk and I thought, wow, this guy's right on. Well, I really like what he has to say. So I bought his book called Primal Awareness. And in chapter three, the heading of chapter three is star, service to all relations. And I thought, wow, that makes sense. That's five point to star and four arrows. That's what it's all about. This is how I came to be here, because he invited me. I met him at that Sundance. The first time I ever met him was last year. That's how I ended up here. And I'm very, very, very honored. I want to thank you for this great opportunity. I'm not educated. I've never gone to school. Well, actually, I did a little bit. <laughs> but I quit. Grade 8, I lost interest. Actually, the first time I lost interest was in grade 2 because uh, these nuns that were teaching us had a system of the way they taught. Somebody would get up and read and they'd get stuck on a word. And she said, anybody know, put up your arm. And we put up our arms. But she'd pick the person that didn't know, to try to get them to know. And I'd always have my hand up because I knew it, I knew it. And they ignored me. So I thought, well, they don't like me used to be in school, so I started playing hooky. Took my slingshot and went hunting. But that's the first time I got disinterested in school. And after that, it just stayed with me. I had no interest in school. I tried to go back. I took what we call Native Studies Instructors Program. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to talk about the sustainable wisdom, they call it, but I'm going to talk about it using my language, how we see it, how we see these things, these terms that are being used in, in this borrowed language that I'm speaking. Here's me right here, in words. 
anybody who wants to get in contact with me for whatever reason, maybe you want to come to the Sundance or something. You know. So I want to talk about this, the relationship that we have to all of creation. I, I, there was a red dot here somewhere, this one in the middle. <laughs> all right, okay. This is called the hierarchy of dependence. The Cree people look at life like this. It's a spiral. When that young man was talking about the wind, how it goes in circles, everything goes in circles, eh? But we call it spirals because it goes like this, right? All of our life is a spiral. So the people are right here. And then the animals are here. Plants are here. The minerals are here. Spirits are here. Then we have creator or creation. Why are we in the middle? We're here. We're there not because we're the most important. We're there because we depend on all of these other ones here for our survival. If we were gone, everything would flourish. We wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> everything would be perfect the way it was before, that veritable Garden of Eden that was here before technology came along. So I just wanted to share that with you. Like this is how we see life, it's not linear. We don't have a linear way of looking at things. If you look at the weather, weather patterns on the news, right? That's the way they are. They move in that way. Everything moves in that way. I used to think that the wind moved in a, in a straight line. But when I went fasting, I'd watch the trees and they'd be going like this, going in circles. And I used to wonder why that is, until I understood that this is how it works. This is how it walks. This acknowledgement and prayer song, we needed to do that. We needed to acknowledge all that is and put everything that is in here. We're looking for wisdom. We're looking for guidance. We have done all of this the way that we see what's happening to us and the environment. It's us that created that. So we have to go to our older brothers and sisters and ask them and our grandmothers and grandfathers, what is it that we can do? What can we do? Can you help us? We have been given that technology, if you want to call it that, to go and ask. There are certain ways that we go and approach them that we go and ask. We have to give something up. What are we willing to give up? My brother that sang up here is a sun dancer also. He also runs a lodge in Nipi, they call it. You know, his tradition. Matut San is what I call it. They sacrifice themselves so that others may live. We have to give something back. When we take something out, we have to give something back because everything works on a system of balance. The whole universe works on a system of balance. You agree? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's always more than one force acting like the planets going around the sun. What keeps them going around? According to the scientists, they say it's centrifugal force, right? Well, what prevents them from flying out? It's a gravitational pull from the sun, they say. So if one of them is missing, something's not going to work right. And what's been missing from our culture, and I'm speaking as people, is that we have been taking, but we have been not been giving anything back. It's time for us to start giving back. When we start giving back, all will start to understand in the universe that we're trying trying to do something to restore balance. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to restore balance. So the question is, what are you willing to give up? Do you believe that there's something greater than us? What we see here called Notre Dame, there's that basilica. 
and they have crosses all over. That's a belief in something greater. We have a belief like that also. We have to believe in something greater than ourselves. Because we didn't make ourselves. And we don't have the knowledge to say, yep, 10 years from now, February 13th, at three o'clock in the morning, I'm going to go home. We don't have that ability. Somebody else is controlling our lives. We have to go to that source, get that information. What can we do? We're like little children. These people in that hierarchy of dependence, we're like two-year-old kids. We're learning how to walk, learning how to walk. We're pulling everything off the coffee table, smashing vases, everything, and we go, oh, what did I do? We don't know. We think we do. We think we know so much, but we know so, so little about life. This young man that talked about that wind, talked about the animals, all has a language. Everything has a language. A language is much more than a spoken word. It's our total being is our language. But we have been stuck in two domains. We have four domains, the mental, the physical, the spiritual, and the emotional. And we're stuck in two domains. Guess which ones those are? The mental and physical, right? Yeah. We're kind of forgetting about the emotional. We're kind of forgetting about the spiritual. Women are more emotional than men, they say. They say they're more right brain than men. Men are left brain. They're on a road to destruction, so to speak. We used to have swings that we'd go from one end of the house to the other. Now we had small houses, right? Then we'd put a blanket around there, and we'd put the babies there. And we'd put a stick to keep the ropes apart, and we'd swing the babies, and the women would sink to the babies, and they'd fall asleep. There's a woman that does that for adults. She was given that gift from her spirits, because there's a time where we have suffered trauma in our lives. And so she brings them to a safe place where the fluid inside the brain goes back and forth according to the scientists and you have whole brain thinking. So it's safe for you to go there. You will not relive that trauma, but you'll be able to deal with that trauma in that state. And that's what we did to their our babies all the time. Had them in that whole brain think all the time. Got that already? I'm behind here. Okay. I said I was raised in Catholic school, and, and uh, I used to serve mass. I was a knight of the altar. As a matter of fact, I wanted to be a priest. I loved it so much. Our church faced east and west, and at high mass at 10:30, we have all these great big windows colored windows and the sun would shine on me and oh yeah God is blessing me he knows what I'm doing my heart's good but it didn't work out well I used to live in a bush I didn't live in town and my grandmother just lived a little ways from us and I had to go through a bush trail to go and visit her my grandmother was up there there was my grandmother and my grandfather but there was a cut line before I got to my grandmother's place and I was running and I looked to my right and there was this guy standing there like this and he had nothing on except his breech club and he had moccasins on and he had this fur headdress and he had horns and he was standing there like this and me being Catholic somebody with horns had to be who? <laughs> you betcha man I saw the devil that's who I saw. So I just froze. I just looked at him and he looked at me. He wasn't moving. And I backed up real slow till I got behind a bush and then I, poof, I took off, I was gone. 
I went and told my dad. He said, oh, no, it's nothing. He said, it's nothing. And I convinced him to come with me to go and see. Of course, there was nobody there. But then I carried that, and I carried that thing about seeing the devil. What we were told in school, catechism, was true. It became true for me. I didn't know until later on in years that who I saw was white standing buffalo. That's who I saw, my spirit guide. So that's six years old. 13 years old, I live this place called Sagatawa. All the rivers meet there, but there's a big lake there. And uh, in, the, in the fall time, it starts freezing. It starts freezing in the shore first, then it eventually freezes all over. And people were skating along the shore. You know, it had been frozen for maybe a week. It was strong enough to hold people. But there was four of us who we thought, well, you know, let's go across and ice was just beautiful. And we wanted to scratch it up. And people were saying, no, don't go. It's not, not thick enough to hold your weight. But we're 13 years old, right? We're not going to listen. So we took off and there was a crack. And it was not wide. And we stepped over that crack and we went to the other side of the lake and we skated there most of the day and it started to get dark. So we thought, well, we better get back. So we came back and they asked me, how are we going to get across? I said, the same way we went across. I said, we'll step over. So everybody did. They all stepped over and I thought, ah, that's too easy. You know? I told the guys, I said, I'm going to jump over that crack. I said, I said yeah. I said, yeah. So I skated back and I came and I jumped over the crack. I went right through the ice and I just sank and it was just pitch black. I couldn't see nothing. And I looked up, I could see this little light. I started swimming toward that light, and when I got up to the top, that water pushed me out. The pressure of the water. The air hit me, took my breath away. Then I got on top of the ice. But in the fall time, the ice bends. It doesn't break. So I'd get on top, and I'd slide back and Get on top, slide back and This one young guy jumped in beside me. He said, I'll help you. Well, he was in trouble, too. The other small guy come up to him, picked him out, and away they went. There was one guy left, the biggest guy in our group, and he tried to come close to me, go like this, and the ice would crack, and he'd jump back. And all this time I'm struggling, struggling, and I can't, and I'm getting tired, I'm cold. And finally he said, I'll get the cops, and he took off. We're about half a mile out, and he took off. During this time, I'm exhausted. I'm starting to sink. This is the last time I'm sinking. I, everything blacked out. I guess I was sinking. I was underwater. All of a sudden, I see this tree. Beautiful, beautiful, trembling aspen tree with the leaves going like that. And a big lump came in my throat. And I thought, I'll never see that tree again. And I felt, felt like crying. Then it came to my mind and said, I can't let this happen. It's like I woke up and I struggled again. I came to the top and I went like this. And I found a hole there, perfectly wrong hole, where there wasn't one before. And I hung on to that. And I seen that guy going way he was gone, just skating. And I started screaming for him, started screaming for him. Finally he stopped and looked. And finally I got him to come back. And I said, throw me your coat. And he threw me his coat. And not close. Come closer, I said. No. I grabbed his coat and he pulled me out. And I was so happy. Wow, so happy. <coughs> so I got home. My mom heard about it. She took my skates and threw them in the fire. <laughs> and those weren't mine. You know, I had borrowed them. <laughs> so I didn't understand why. Why a tree? Why didn't I think of my mom or my dad or anybody, my relatives, why a tree? I never knew that. In 1983, there was a roadblock in northern Saskatchewan. We were blocking uh, uranium mining. So we went to help and assist these people. 
and we were there about two days. This one guy said, hey, let's build a sweat lodge. Everybody said, okay. I didn't even know what a sweat lodge was. So we built a sweat lodge and we had no blankets, so we used moss, covered it with moss and we went inside. And this guy that was conducting it had this pail there and a little stick and he was singing. All of a sudden I was gone. I was, I was out in outer space somewhere and I could see these rocks going by and I was wondering what, was, what I was doing there, where I was. I wasn't sure. I could hear him singing and I could hear the other people inside the lodge but I had no sensation of being inside that sweat lodge. And I was looking around, looking around as I was floating, until I heard, I gotta get out! Somebody said that, right? And that was right back in my body, and they opened the door and the guy crawled out and said, shit, you wrecked my trip. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first experience with a sweat lodge. Matutsan ceremony. I'll go there first. It was about 1984. We went to Hobima, Alberta. These people asked me if I wanted to go to a ceremony. I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. I didn't know what I was in for. So we went to a sweat lodge. There was an old man running that sweat lodge. And when they closed the door, he started to sink. And these rattles took off. There was about three of them just flying all over inside the lodge and lighting up. And I thought, how did he do that? Houdini, right? That's what I thought. How did he do that? It must be Houdini. It's got to be something like that, you know. Couldn't figure out. And then I heard this thing trying to break through like those storm windows, stretching, 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 going like that. And all of them broke through. And there was an old lady, old, old lady started talking, talking in the creek, telling us how happy she was that we came from such a long way to come and visit her. And she used some words that I didn't know because it was old, old creek. But she told that man, you have to have a ceremony tonight. So that night was the first time I ever experienced what they call a weepy ceremony, where they tie up a person tied her hands behind her back and they throw a blanket over him and they tie him up like that. They lay him face down. And people just all over, all over the floor, the walls, and I'm against the wall, not knowing what to expect or what's gonna happen. When they laid him down, they, sh they shut the lights off, but they had put a great big tarp over the door and they nailed it on there. And they put a suitcase there with a can of tobacco and a jar full of water. As soon as they closed the lights and they started seeing that door open and slam shut. And then the rattle started again. They started going all over, all over the ceiling. They're going all over. I didn't know what was happening. And I didn't know that anybody, how can anybody walk in the dark anywhere? You know, people, they're, being touched. I, I couldn't understand that. They had the bear was coming, came in, was eating the food on there. You can hear him slurping the food, the blueberries. And then sun dancers came in and they're all <sighs> and blowing the whistles at the same time. I couldn't figure it out. I was still on that Houdini thing. Right? How did this man do that? How did he do that? And finally he said, this next one that's coming in is a giant. It's a giant of a spirit, but he's very gentle. He said, he's backwards. Some people call him Hayoka in Lakota. Or Tugukan is what we call him, Naspatsaisino in my language. But he said, he'll come in really strong, but don't be afraid of him. And if you ask for help, you have to tell him, I don't want your help. You have to say everything backwards. So he warned us and they started singing and all of a sudden, whoo, you know, just screaming. He just jumped when he came in. He came in so strong and banging his feet on the, on the floor. There's a cement floor, eh? but the floor shook when he did that. I know, how can this be? How can this happen? 
and he started coming around and I could hear people moaning. And this guy that was sitting beside me, he was moaning really, really hard when this guy was here in front of him. He was going, oh, oh, moaning like that. And I thought, oh man, I'm next. I really don't want him to stop here. I told him that. I said, you keep going. I said, I don't want you. I don't want your help at all. I said, you know, just keep going. The other guy needs more help than I And I'm calling him, right? So he came in front of me, stopped in front of me. I couldn't see him, but I could feel him looking at me like this. And I'm trying not to look at him and moan like this. And it's pitch black, right? Pitch dark. Then he just grabbed my head like this. His fingers were over here and his thumb was over here. He had such huge hands. And he just shook my head like this. And I could feel that he was all wood. His hand was made and his arm was made out of wood. And I never understood what that was. Until my wife told me here, I don't know, about a couple of months ago, she said, that was a tree, a Sundance tree, spirit. I said, yeah, you're right, that's what it was. But I didn't understand what happened. The ceremony was over, we had a feast, we finished, and I wrestled with that. How did he do it? One or two days later, when I was thinking about it, my next question was, where the hell have I been? Where the hell have I been all my life? I finally found out that there's something other than us. When I went to church, the only other that I believed in was the devil. I didn't really believe in God because if I believed in God, I wouldn't have been scared of the devil, right? But the devil was most prominent. So that was in 19, or 1984. So after that, I was sold. If there was three sweats that day, I'd go to three sweats. And I was always chasing for this one person who had that gift, and only certain people have that gift to be able to bring those spirits in in that way. It doesn't mean that you won't experience that yourself, even if you don't have that medicine person. You may. So, that's, I went back to school. That kind of straightened me out. I went back to school, I took this Native Studies, and uh, one of the questions they asked us, what is Native Studies? And I thought, well, is it Native people uh, studying history, their history? Or is it Native history being learned by people? You know, all these kind of questions, right? And I finished it. I had a real struggle finishing it because my teachers were non-Aboriginal teachers. And I thought, well, how can they teach me about me? They've never lived my life. What they learn is from books. So how can they be authorities on me in my life? So that was a real struggle for me. There was 20 of us, and they all went to university from there. I didn't even think about going to university. I wanted to go and find out the real history from Native people. So at that particular time, I was writing to people from Six Nations Confederacy. I think it was Akwasasni. They had a school called New Freedom School where they had Mohawk immersion to grade one to grade six. And I told them I was interested in wanting to learn the culture. Didn't matter what kind of culture, as long as it's Aboriginal culture, I wanted to learn it. So they said, yeah, you can come. Come if you want. So when we finished, I went back home for a little bit. I was waiting for an opportunity to go to the East, east Coast. These people come and said, hey, you want to come to a ceremony with us? We're going to Alberta for a ceremony. I said, yeah, I remember that last ceremony I was at. So we went to northern Alberta. There was a Cree woman. Her name is Rose Oje, woman who stands strong. We went to her ceremony, and her ceremony was impressive. There, too, the grandfathers were touching me, the spirits. I couldn't believe what was happening. So I thought, I want to stay here. I'm not going back home. But I ended up back home, and I came back. I had offerings, I had prints, I had tobacco, and I had a gift. I had a beautiful beaded buckskin jacket that I just loved. I took that off and I said, here's my offerings, I want to learn. 
I don't have a job, but I can work. I'm not scared of work. Morning till night, I can work. I said, if you'll let me stay here to learn. So she took those offerings and prayed with him. And I was thinking, I was just praying, oh, please, God, you know, allow, let this happen. And she said, you can stay. Oh, I was so happy. I spent two and a half years with that woman in a bush. We lived in a bush. No electricity, no running water. We, we lived hunting, had a big garden, everything self-sufficient. But we traveled all over. She went and did ceremonies all over healing people. That was an immersion for me. And it happened to be Cree, my language. So I really learned, learned lots there. Had that beautiful opportunity. How much time do I have? 15 minutes? OK, I'll go through this real fast. While there, I got that name, White Standing Buffalo. I was inside a sweat lodge, and I didn't know I was going to get a name. I never asked for it. The spirits came in, and they told me, this is your name. And I was so proud. I was so happy. This one spirit had three kind of three fingers, but long claws on it grabbed me by my braid and went like this. And I, right away, I went like this. I thought, oh, better not. You know, so I let him go in, ducked me in a pail of water, pulled me out, ducked me in again. Every time he pulled me out, that heat would hit me from the sweat and go <gasps> again inside. The third time he held me underwater and I could breathe underwater. I had no sensation of being underwater at all. And then he let me up, let me go, then scratched me here. I had three scratches, and I thought, oh, look, guys, look. It's like Bruce Lee. <laughs> the spirits, you know, did that. I was so proud. I never understood what that was about, why they held me underwater. It was to teach me about the possibility of what human beings can do if they believe in something. If you believe in that, you can do it. So that was my underwater experience in 1985. Now, I told her the story about the tree. I give her offerings. So she prayed with it. And I said, I want to understand it. She said, that was a tree of life that came to save your life. She said, someday you're going to have to go back and pay for it. And I thought, oh no, I got a sun dance. I don't want a sun dance. And I've seen how hard it is. Eh? So the first year we went there and I helped around. I was, it was nice, eh? but my heart was always thumping because every time somebody would look at me, an elder would look at me, they want me to dance. You know? so I, was, I was kind of scared. Eh? But the next year I started dancing. And that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do because I got so dry in here, this lump just grew and I, I couldn't swallow. I now scared to choke. I'm, I'm really scared of not breathing. I've always been like that. I don't know why, but that lump was there and that was really difficult for me. But I finally got through it. I got through that. Got through that sun dance and I danced. I messed a couple of years. But 1984, I thought, you know, I never really formally acknowledged that tree, never paid that tree back for my life. So I bought a big, long blue print uh, that's like this red cloth here, but blue. And I brought a blanket and I had some money in an envelope. I came to this guy, our Sundance chief. I said, look, I said, this is my story. This is what I want to do. I want to pay for that tree, pay for my life. He said, I know just the man you've got to talk to. He took me to an old man. And that old man listened to my story. He said, come with me. So we went. And there's a hole here where that tree is going to go. But it's like this here on a tripod. And all those old men were over here. And he said, you stand beside me. And I stood beside him like this, not knowing what was going on. And they had ropes on there. They pulled it up. And so that old man said, ho, oh, and pulled that up, tree up and on its way up. All these old men started crying. And me too, I just bawled and bawled and bawled. I don't know why. 
But I cried, I cried. Till that tree was up, once that tree was up, everybody cheered. There's no more crying. And on our last night, I was sleeping inside the lodge. About four o'clock in the morning, apparently what happened is my wife was pregnant. And these two old ladies came up to her elders, said, you're gonna have your baby tonight. And she said, oh, no, no, doctor said two weeks. They said, no, tonight. She said, no, doctor said two weeks. Okay, they said, they laughed and left. Sure enough, four o'clock in the morning, they come and woke me up. And I'm still in a daze, right? I'm still in that ozone there from dancing. So I came out of there, found my keys, I jumped in the car and I took off. I forgot her. <coughs> I forgot to load her up. <coughs> so people were hollering and I had to come back. I picked her up. We went to the hospital and we're out knocking on the doors. No answer. It's locked, man. Small little town, Bonneville. Finally, two nurses come and they looked at us like this and they stopped and they chatted and I'm pounding on the door. Because she's, oh, oh, you know. They said, what can we do for you? I said, we need a doctor. I said, it's going to have a baby. She said, well, we don't have no doctor. I said, well, give us a room or something, you know. So they put us in a room. And they went to look for a doctor. Just <coughs> to call one. But the baby came, a tiny little baby. And I was looking for a towel, you know, water bowl, you know. I didn't know what to do. She said, oh, for God's sake, give her to me, you know. So I took that baby, not wanting to touch it. <laughs> gave her to her. The doctor came in. Oh, he said, already, yeah. So they cleaned up the baby and cut the umbilical cord. <coughs> so I sat on an easy boy chair and right away I was gone. I fell asleep. So she woke me up. She said, are you going to go back? <coughs> I said, no, no, I'll stay here and watch you. I got to take care of you. She said, you know, our son is over there. He's three years old. Eh? I said, oh, yeah, I got to go back. <laughs> so I went back and I opened a tent. My son was sleeping and I crawled in with him. And I thought, oh, I'm just dozing off. And somebody shook my foot. I looked up, here's that old man. Vigisi Stan, he said, means you're going to go and finish. I said, no, I got to watch my son. I said, he said, yeah, never mind that. He said, I got daughters, I got granddaughters, they'll take care of them. You go back. And I was walking in. <laughs> Didn't want to go back. Eh? It was about maybe nine o'clock by that time. And uh, they were already dancing. And I went in and I danced. Then you go down after the dance is finished behind a little fence. <coughs> and I heard this old man coming in. Nepawe, he said, means stand up. So I stood up and he announced the birth of my baby daughter. And right away the whistles were going and I started singing and everybody's dancing. And the Sundance Lodge started to spin around like this. And all I could see was colors from the cloth, just like a rainbow. And then I started to lift up like this, flipping over. And I came to this place with beautiful, beautiful green grass and little paths on there. And people were walking there, Cree people. And they were talking in Cree. Their voices were so gentle. And her laughter, very, very gentle. And I watched all of that. I could hear the sun dance. I could hear people singing. I could hear people talking. Could hear the whistle from the drums, <clears throat> but I had no sensation of dancing. That's from nine o'clock in the morning till about six o'clock at night. <clears throat> when the Sundance chief came in, he said, "We're going to have four more songs. We're going to shut her down." In my mind, I was thinking, "No, don't, don't stop, don't stop, let it go." In. I didn't want to come back. It was such a beautiful place I was in. So again, that tree acknowledged me for doing what I did. I followed through. I completed, restored balance for them giving me life. That's 1994. I just have a couple of minutes in, so I'm not going to be able. I wanted to talk about trees. I'll just skip these two here. Star Lodge and Symbols, I'll just skip that part. I want to talk to the, about the trees. And, and I want to show you <clears throat> the trembling aspen. That's that tree that saved me. It's called Mitos. <clears throat> that's a tree that I work with. I also work with that tree in the Star Lodge ceremony. 
and meters. I think it's important that I, <coughs> this is right here, meters, poplar tree. Me, 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 tus means to give. It's, it's a giver of life. It gave me life when I was drowning. It also gave life of my child and gave me a different kind of life to a different level of living when it, they took me away. Me, tus. This is what that's all about, what you call a thirst dance or the sun dance. These are the trees we use, and they're the givers of life. Imi to ik is what they say. It means you're giving to each other. People sacrifice their lives. They don't eat, they don't drink water. They dance in a hot sun or in the rain, whatever, whatever kind of weather, because you're dancing so that other people may live. And that's what we do. So that's a very, very important tree. I'm just going to go through these other ones here. The ceremonies that I have been given, I carry certain ceremonies. I have the first one that I was given was a pipe. That's the first thing we're usually given. With the pipe is attached ceremonies. The first one that I was given was a, what they call the sweat lodge, Matutsan. Then after that, I was given the star lodge ceremony. Then I was given a shake dance ceremony and eventually the sun dance lodge. I never wanted to dance again. I had quit dancing. And I said, that's it. I told my wife, I'm not going to dance no more. I'm finished. I met this one guy, him and I hit it off. We were up till four o'clock in the morning. He was the sun dance chief. And we were cracking jokes, you know. He said, you know, we really hit it all. I said, yeah, we did. He said, you know, I'd really be honored if you come and dance in my son dance. And I thought, oh, you know, <laughs> my newfound friend, I really didn't want to say no to him. So I said, okay, I'll go and dance one year. So I went over there and you go first year, second year, third year, and fourth year. That's how you're. So I went to the fourth year. And the guys were looking at me. Your fourth year? I said, yeah. I said, I'm more than that. I said, I dance lots, son dances. Before, so. And they called that Sundance chief. Oh, yeah, he said, he forgot to tell you. He said, in the Sundance, you've got to dance four years. So you've got to start. He said, don't think nothing, uh, don't think anything negative of it. He said, there's a special reason why you're doing that. So I was kind of, you know, I got to dance another four years now. Go from Saskatchewan to Manitoba, and that's a long ways. Or from BC, right? We travel from BC to Manitoba, that's three provinces over. So I finally finished, and I thought, oh, I'm done. Am I ever happy to be finished? No more dancing for me. We had a ceremony that one night, that Sundance chief, he said, come with me outside, and I'm gonna go and have a smoke. I said, okay. He stood out there, he lit a cigarette. He said, I got something to tell you. I said, oh, no, oh, no. I said, don't tell me nothing. He said, I have to tell you, he said, I have to tell you. He said, I'm gonna to have to tie you up. I said, what? I know, I said, I'm not being tied up, no way. I said, no. Well, he said, you got another choice. I said, well, what's that? He said, well, I can hang a skull from your back in the sweat lodge. I said, well, that's not a choice. I said, one's just as bad as the other. He said, well, you got a third choice. I said, what's that? He said, you don't have to do either of them. I said, well, now that's a choice. I said, don't take that one. But, he said, that tree gives you your life. He said, you don't own your life anymore. That tree owns your life. He said, if you don't do that, what you've been instructed to do, he said, we don't know. So it's kind of like a threat, right? And I thought, oh, okay, tie me up. I had a brand new ribbon shirt, like this one. My mother-in-law makes my ribbon shirts for me. Never wore it before, I wore it that night. So they tied me up, when they tied me up, all of a sudden this incredible heat came and I couldn't breathe. I said, don't tie me, tie me. He said, why? I said, because I can't breathe. I said, I gotta take my shirt off. No, you can't take your shirt off. He said, I can't untie you. The only way you can take it off is to cut it off. He said, cut it off. I said, cut it off. <laughs> so he cut my shirt off. <laughs> but, you know, I, I had to go through that. And after that, he told me there was, he dreamt about this drum following him when he's coming from Manitoba, it's coming to British Columbia. And I thought, oh no, no, 
there's more to it, you know. Yeah, he said, you know, your face came up there. He said, oh. So he said, you know, you, can, you still have a choice. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. But I, that's when I started becoming a Sundance chief. Man. So now I'm going to dance till I die. But it's not bad, right? Because I'm in charge. <laughs> Actually, my wife was in charge. She, her and her mother put everything together. And she calls me out with Presley because he said, you just show up and do the ceremony. <laughs> so so I'll, I guess I'll end it there. I don't have any more time. So. I know that there's so much that you're thinking about. Yeah. This is an opportunity to learn some stuff that you're not going to learn anywhere. So uh, can you answer some questions? Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll See if I have the answer. We're finished. <laughs> <laughs> I just have, uh, I just kind of connected a couple of dots um, between what you said and what David said about things being in balance, the give and take. And as uh, David, your seating uh, speaker, David, had said about, you know, um, the writings, the stories being written down. To me, that, and then by having a written story, whoever's reading that sort of takes it and sort of goes sequesters themselves someplace else other than where the story originated from. And to me, what you were saying in part was as stories are written, the stories are taken from the land and read someplace else. And to me, that's not in balance in that you're in essence, you're, you're slowly killing the Mother Earth by taking that story <coughs> away. And, and not giving anything back. All the stories are here, like I said, all of creation. We take those stories and we take parts of them and we write our own script. But we connect it to something. This tree, this, that Sundance tree, the white poplar, the trembling aspen, the biochemistry of that tree and the fluidity of it allows it to be able to take that information from the star nations and keeps it in a, it has DNA similar to a human being, but superimposed on top of that DNA is other symbols that they have drawn from the star nations. And then they put it through their roots and travels through their roots to uh, what those little fine little, what that be we call them, real fine, like the synapse in their brain, it shoots it to others, the plants and other trees so that they will have that information too. So that's why people use flowers, they use other things that they have information from. For me, it's that tree, and I go sit with them tree, and they tell me that information from the Star Nations. That tree and the Star Lodge ceremony, I use the same kind of tree, and they have a very, very specific connection to the Thunder Beings and to the Star Nations, what we call the Star People. And the Star People tell us they're our older brothers and sisters, and they used to walk with us here before, and then they pulled back, but now they see where we're at in our history and what's happening, so they want to come back and help us. So that Star Lodge is a way to do it. The last one we did, there was a vortex there, but it needed the two leggings and that ceremony to activate it, so now people can go back and forth with relative ease. So all that information is there, it comes from, from what we call the grandfathers, if you, if you will. But that's where the stories come from. I'd like to offer maybe a takeaway. Both Tom and I have had near-death experiences that seem to make the access to the spiritual world a little faster, but it's not necessary. And as someone that has not has lived in, in, in these two worlds, um, at first on Pine Ridge, I would come home to my wife and go, uh, I don't know how to explain this. Or I would come back from having a telepathic conversation with a lot of rural person. And I, I go back and I go, I, I, I don't know how to explain this. But once you begin to, to believe in the spirit, two aspects of what is around us, the breath, as David says, and, and the, and the trees, and, and Whatever becomes all of a sudden something that's, that you resonate with, this would become truly really matter of fact and begin to access the, the spirit world. And, um, and 
so uh, the experiences that we're having, that he is having, are open to all of us. And then one last thing. His son dances. He's, he's working uh, with Bruce Lipton, who wrote a book called uh, Biology of Belief. Yep. And um, they are, unlike, like, like Rick Tudor's only allows, he doesn't allow non-Indian people to have sun dance, just because the spirits came to him. Not that he thinks it's wrong necessarily, but the spirits have told him that. Standing White like Buffalo is encouraging people to come and be helpers at the sun dance and to be learning about it and to ultimately participate. And so um, I just want to let you you know that that's happening. They have 40 people this year from all over the world. And uh, this, is, this is something that uh, I wanted to share. As a kind of transition question to our talking circle, would you say something about how you integrate this, these stories and these experiences that you just told us about with your Catholic um, side or your Catholic upbringing? How do you put it together? It's one and the same thing. It's, uh, they use different words. They use angels. We use grandfathers. It's the same thing. Uh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was a very, very gifted, very, very gifted, beautiful, beautiful medicine person the way that we see him. And he said, there is no other way unless it's through me. Through him is what he was talking about. He was talking about love, loving, loving thy neighbor, loving all of that. We, we, it's the same thing for us. We sacrifice our lives so that other people may live. I was just sharing with four arrows the other day that this man, this beautiful, gifted medicine person, Jesus Christ, knew exactly what was going to happen to him when he went and fasted. He was told that he was going to, he was going to be whipped, he was going to lose his life. Can you imagine the feeling he must have went through? Because when I feel that feeling of going to the tree and hanging or dragging skulls when I'm pierced, it, it, it's scary because sometimes it can be, you can just breeze through it like nothing. Other times you just like you're carrying a whole world and it's so painful, it's incredibly painful that you don't want to ever, ever do it, but you have to, you're, you do it because of what you believe in. And, and I, I can just imagine just a little bit of what he must have felt and gone through when he went, went to his death, knowing full well that he was doing it for everybody. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My wife and I got a card from one of those people that came from Europe. She wrote, she said, I cannot comprehend how you people can open a door for us to come here, knowing full well that it is us that stole your land, it is us that persecuted you, and yet you opened a doorway, you brought us to the tree, you healed us. In addition to that, you let your children heal us. I can't comprehend that, she said. But it's all about love. And, and that's what's going to set everything right. Another thing that's very, very important is, I went to another ceremony, some people call it, the non-Aboriginal people call it a ghost dance, but it's not what it's called, it's called Waska Simwin. It means to dance in a circle, you call in the spirits. And they had women sitting here, the youngest one, up to the oldest one over here, and all the food and everything is there. And the, the men sit over here, the youngest one to the oldest man here that's conducting the ceremony. And I came walking across over here and I sat in front of that old man. And he said, you've never been to one of these before? I said, no, I don't know what I'm doing. So he started to explain to me. But everybody was looking, right? Because I'm sitting in front at the head. <laughs> you know, I didn't know. But he never said nothing. And then I seen him, they had this great big bundle that they were smudging. And it had a kerchief around it with flowers on it, beautiful flowers. And he said, you know what that is? I said, no. He said, that's a bundle, a hair bundle from the women for thousands of years. He said, those hair bundles were kept by certain families. But when the, uh, the Europeans came, they said they took all of them and burnt most of them. 
He said, this one survived. He said, when the women are strong enough to take that bundle back and walk with it, that's when everything will start to change. So it's the women that are going to make the change. We can assist and help in whatever way that we can. Like I said, it's my wife and it's her mother that do everything. They do everything for that Sundance Lodge. All I do is they're just conduct the ceremony. That's all I do. I don't do very much. Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, thank you.